出去，赶上破了，山上的木叶多又多。In this video, I went to a beautiful town in Hunan Province. A Chinese writer from this town, who was nominated for Nobel Prize in Literature, wrote a novel named *The Border Town*. Although in the book the story was set in another town, the description of that town was actually based on the author's hometown. If you are familiar with China's map, you will know that Hunan Province is not near any national border. How come there is a border town here? Get on the boat. Let's travel together, and I'll tell you the story. Hello, I'm Yan Yan. Today I'm in an ancient town named Fenghuang in Hunan Province. Fenghuang means Phoenix in Mandarin. The Great Wall built in the Ming Dynasty to separate Han and the Miao people is about 15 kilometers away. So technically, this town used to be a border town in history. And today, let's explore this border town together. Did you notice behind me there is a series of stones in the water? This is how people used to cross the river. This is a common thing in ethnic minority villages in southwest China. Fenghuang used to be a town of ethnic minority. Since the 14th century, as more and more Han Chinese settled here, it developed into the border region of Han and ethnic minority people. You'll find heritage of both in this town. Actually, now the region Fenghuang belongs to is an ethnic minority autonomous prefecture. Visitors usually would take a boat from the dock in front of the northern gate of the ancient town. Let's do it as well, and I'll tell you the stories along the way. The most unique scenery of this town is these houses by the river. They are built on stilts overhanging the water. What caused houses to be built like this? To understand that, you have to see the other side of these houses. A stone wall is standing right in front of the houses across a narrow street. That's the city wall built in the Ming Dynasty. In the novel *The Border Town*, the author described the riverside street as well as the houses. About the street, there is a riverside street. Connecting the docks. See, the docks could be accessed from the street. About the stilted houses, space is so limited that on the street, most houses are built on stilts overhanging the water. So the reason for the houses to be built on stilts is that the ancient city wall is so close to the river bank that space left for constructing houses is limited. Look at these houses; almost an entire room is on stilts. Stilted houses are typical residence for ethnic minority people living in mountains in southwest China. People convert mountain into terrace. And stilted houses give them more space on each floor. In Xijiang Miao Village, layers and layers of houses are built in the slope of the mountain in this way. These stilted houses in Fenghuang were probably inspired by the houses of ethnic minority people, since the town is in the border region. Near the bridge are the oldest stilted houses in the town. Most have been abandoned. I guess it's not safe to live inside them now. <laughs> 
taking a boat on the green water in a local folk song, passing the arc of the roofed bridge and gazing on the old stilted houses by the river. This is the enchanting experience that attracts visitors from around the world. Speaking of the roofed bridge, it's a typical type of bridge in southwest China, especially in ethnic minority regions. People call it wind and rain bridge as it provides shelter for people in windy and rainy days. It's another evidence of influence of ethnic minority culture in this town. As the boat keeps going, we arrived at the bend of the river. Ahead of us, a complex is spread on the slope of the mountain. That is the Wenshou Palace. I'm inside the Wenshou Palace, which was the guild hall of Jiangxi merchants. Actually, this Wenshou Palace was built by a Jiangxi merchants in the 18th century. Above me is the stage, and let's go take a look. Stage is the focal point of a guild hall, and it's always above the entrance in a guild hall. This was the place for migrants from Jiangxi province to have social activities. It's like the location of Tangsmen Association. This Wanshou Palace used to have 4,000 square meters with more than 20 halls, but now only the stage remains. Opera performance was an important entertaining activity during social gathering of Townsmen Association. Usually the stage is facing the main worshipping hall. Tables would be set in the courtyard in front of the stage. People socialize while drinking tea and enjoying the performance. Outside the Wanshou Palace on the riverbank, there is a stone pagoda. Pagoda is a common thing in China, but so far this is the only one I've seen on the riverbank. It's a seven-story hollow pagoda. It was originally a three-story pagoda built in the 18th century. The original purpose of the pagoda was to burn paper with scripts. It sounds weird, but in old times, in some regions, it was believed that paper with scripts on it could not be thrown away. It had to be burned in a pagoda, sort of like worshipping of scripts, or in a broader concept, worshipping of culture and education. That is my best explanation. Anyway, the pagoda was demolished and was rebuilt in 1980s. Now it does not serve its original purpose anymore. The bridge ahead of us is about the first the boat could go. The boat then turned around and parked at the dock outside the Wanshou Palace. I'm going to take you to walk along the riverbank and inside the ancient town which is located at my right hand side. <laughs> This is the eastern gate of the city wall. There are four holes above the arc, and you'll see what there are for soon. Like many other ancient towns, the streets are paved with stone slabs. I'll first show you what's inside the hall atop the city gate. The history and gene of the town is inside. Hanging on the wall is the military map of this region. The fort, the watchtowers, the beacon towers, 
and the Southern Great Wall, which was first built in the 16th century to separate Miao and Han people who had sporadic conflicts. During the 18th century, after several large-scale uprisings led by Miao people in this region, the Qing court fortified previously abandoned Southern Great Wall and beefed up the military force here. Out of the 100,000 population in the town, 11,000 were soldiers. Fenghuang became a military town. In the novel The Border Town, the author wrote, Except for some agricultural households that owned fields in the hills, and some merchant households that engaged in lending or trade of oil and rice, most households in town are military households that moved here with the army. In one of these old streets, there is an old house. A famous Chinese writer was born here. His name is Shen Chongwen. Today I brought his famous novel, The Border Town. It was through this novel that many people started to know this land. I've already quoted this book many times, and I'll quote more. It helps us understand Feng Huang. This house has a very typical layout of Chinese houses during Ming and Qing dynasty. I'll quickly walk you around it. Facing the front gate, in the center, there is a central hall which serves like today's living room. There is a room on each side of the central hall. In this house, they both serve as bedroom. The side rooms are connected via a hallway behind the central hall. Kitchen and backyard is located behind. This is the other bedroom. Usually in a bigger house, there would be several courtyards and halls, one behind another. In this house, there is only one. But compared with those stilted houses by the river, this house is way more spacious and comfortable. I guess the time spent in the study room during childhood laid a solid foundation in Mr. Shen's career in literature. He was nominated for Nobel Prize in Literature consecutively in 1987 and 1988, but was unfortunately passed away in May of 1988. This house was bought by Mr. Shen's grandfather, who came from a poor family and had a successful career in the army. In old times in this town, joining the army was a popular way to climb the social ladder. There are many other houses and ancestral halls in the town for visitors to see. In early 20th century, there were many figures from this remote town who made it to the political stage of China, including the first prime minister of the government established after the Qing dynasty. Most of them had a military career or from military households. Even not able to become a general, people who joined the army at least got a salary. That's how normal people in this town made a living. Kids were sent to the army before they were 18, so that there is one more bread earner in the family. Since the Opium War in 1840, China had experienced a dark time of civil wars and invasion of foreign power. The soldiers from Fenghuang were involved in every war ever since, from the Opium War to the Second World War. Only the lucky ones became the general. Most died in battlefields far away from home. Back to the Eastern Gate. I'm going to walk on the city wall. This is a typical wall built in the Ming Dynasty. I've shown you similar ones in my other videos. Outside the city wall is the stilted houses. Generally speaking, in old times, rich people lived in the houses inside the town, whereas people like dock workers, boatmen, and other underclass lived in the stilted houses by the river. The wall separated the space into two walls. 
During the flood season, the city wall could act as a levy to protect residents inside the town, while those living in the stilted houses were the first victims of flood. There is description of that in the border town. In spring, when the river rises up to the street by the river, families living on the street throw long ladders from their roofs to the city wall and, cursing and shouting, taking their bundles, bedding, and big rice containers, climb the ladders into the town. When the water recedes, they come out through the city gate. This is the northern gate. The wooden gate is wrapped with iron. It's about as thick as the length of my hand. There is an enclosure outside the gate, which is a common part of the city wall as an extra layer of defense. From the northern gate, turn right is the riverside street. Those living on the street could come out through this gate, or they could come out through the eastern gate, which is right next to the other end of the street. Let's keep going and see what's ahead. Another dock. This is the best spot to see these oldest houses in town. Notice the wooden pumpkins on the beam? If you watched my video about Tujia people, you would know it's a Tujia house. During my four day stay in the town, for one day it was raining heavily. And this was what I filmed after about 12 hours raining. The water had risen to the level of the river bank. The path below was already under the water. The stones in the water for people to cross the river had disappeared. They were also under the water. The water was running fast. This is the northern gate. The dock where I took the boat was also inundated. This was after only 12 hours raining. Imagine if it keeps raining for days and weeks, which happens. In the novel, the author wrote, at times, the river rises so suddenly that some houses on the street are swept away in the eyes of the watchers on the city wall, including the victims themselves who take this loss as phlegmatically as any other natural calamity they are powerless to avert. One of the reasons that Mr. Shen's work was highly regarded was because he focused on the life of the poor people and their struggle. The rain gets heavier and heavier. Just like the day in November of 1937, when over 20,000 soldiers from this town died in a deadly battle against the Japanese army in Zhejiang province. The commander of that troops returned and knelt down in front of the northern gate for three days. Almost every household in the town raised a white flag to call back the spirit of their lost ones. Sadness hand over the entire town. A town that is associated with wars associates with sadness. Of course, the wars were history. Fenghuang has converted into a town of tourism. The stories became an asset to the town as well as the beautiful scenery. The stilted houses on the riverbank, which were home to the pool, became popular bed and breakfast places. Some travel magazines even named Fenghuang as one of the four ancient towns in China that travelers shouldn't miss. In my next video of this series, I'll take you to the other side of the Southern Great Wall, which was the so-called Miao territory in history. I'll take you to two Miao villages. The valley, the big cave in the mountain, the waterfall falling from heart-shaped sky. This is the land where Miao people live for generations.
I'm Yan Yan. I make videos about sets of interest in China and histories and stories behind them. Subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time.